circle those references or, or to mark them with an X or something so that at some point later you can do your own study. Take a look at these verses. It'll help you to review them, read through them in the order that they appear there. Because it'll help you to think more biblically about how the unseen realm is organized under the spirit of this age, Satan, and how it all is working in this age. You get some insight into that. After all, the warfare taking place there has direct bearing and impact on the way life unfolds and plays out here. That's what Psalm 82 is telling us. And, and the, the, the direction of, of the wicked to oppress the, the needy underneath them. Also we see it in, in Daniel chapter 10 as well. And also as the Apostle Paul clearly states in Ephesians 6 here, when he lists the rank and file of the evil fallen beings. He says, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Satan, the spirit of this age, the prince of this world, as Jesus calls him, supervises the princes of the various nations, called here principalities. And beneath those principalities, there are lesser beings called powers. And then the rulers of darkness beneath them. And then finally, the spiritual host of wickedness. A demonic army, all under the control of Satan. This is how things are organized. The Bible is telling this, this here. And that's what impacts our, the nations here. One realm, the unseen realm, impacting us on this side of it. And as much as we love our nation, America, as much as we believe that America was founded as a Christian nation, we have to look at these things and also be wise according to the scriptures regarding America. Understanding that America is also subject to the same evil and vile rank and file that is under Satan's direction and control. We're not immune. That should be obvious to us in this day and age. And that is why I believe that even in America, even in America's founding, there has been an evil influence at work. A seed of wickedness planted at the time of our nation's birth. If we look carefully, we can see evidence of this evil. And that's what I want to do with you for the balance of this morning. I want to present to you, for your own consideration, evidence that there is and that there has been for some time an evil spirit of this age at work in our nation. There's hints of it if we take a look and see what's there. Back in the mid-80s, uh, actually it was uh, mostly during the year 1987, I made several trips down to Washington, D.C. just to kind of wander there. Sometimes I'd go on my own just to wander through the Smithsonian Museums on the National Mall or sometimes with friends. Here I am from those days. In case I got confused, my name is on my shirt. That's the man that Debbie married. Her man in Washington. Okay. On one occasion, I was there with a couple of friends, John and Lisa. And we're walking through one of the museums, specifically it was the, the, the National Museum of American History. And we came around a corner, and, and, and I suddenly saw this. It was rather stunning, especially to see it in three dimensions, not just a picture of it. George Washington, the father of our country, right? Portrayed to be a pagan Greek god. 
This statue, I think it's 11 foot high, and I forget how many tons that it weighs. It's a big one, marble statue. Created by Horatio Greenow in honor of Washington's 100th birthday, was commissioned by the U.S. Congress on July the 14th, 1832, and it was completed in 1840. Congress had decided that a marble statue of Washington done in the European style, that's almost a direct quote from, from something that I read, should be in the Capitol Rotunda. That's what it, was, what it was designed for, what it was made for, and where it was going to be placed, in the Capitol Rotunda, which itself had been built between 1818 and 1824, and so they were going to put that in there. The dome that we are familiar with was added later, uh, finished right after the Civil War ended. When I saw this statue, I thought at the time, and I still think, how very odd <laughs> it, it, it is that, that somebody thought it was a good idea to portray Washington as a pagan god. That's crazy. Greenow based his portrayal on an ancient Greek statue of Zeus. It was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, this statue of Zeus. It doesn't exist anymore. But Zeus is the chief deity, the chief god of the Greek pantheon of gods and goddesses. He heads them all up. I don't have time to get into it this morning, but there's evidence from scripture that, uh, that Zeus uh, and Satan are kind of like the same. And here's Washington, right? <laughs> But apparently, uh, I mean, I thought we were a Christian nation. You know, I, I, that's what I was thinking. But obviously, there's some other belief systems at work here and have been for some time, and they're manifesting in, in kind of strange ways. When the Capitol building was occupied briefly by protesters on Wednesday, January 6th of 2021, last year, two U.S. senators as noted in the congressional record for that same date, two of them referred to the Capitol building as a temple. A temple. Senator Chuck Schumer of New York told the Senate Assembly, this temple to democracy was desecrated. By the way, we're not a democracy. We're a representative republic, which that's kind of what got Chuck Schumer his job. Okay, just, just be aware of that. But he says this temple to democracy was desecrated, its windows smashed, and our offices vandalized. Senator Dick Durbin of Illinois later expressed similar thoughts. He said, this is a special place. This is a sacred place. But this sacred place was desecrated by a mob today on our watch. This temple to democracy was defiled by thugs. A temple. On that same Wednesday evening in the House of Representatives, Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, stated during her opening remarks, on Sunday, the previous Sunday to that Wednesday, of course, she says, it was my great honor to be sworn in as Speaker and to preside, now get this, over a sacred ritual of renewal. As we gathered under this dome of this temple of democracy to open the 117th Congress. Very interesting language coming from these lawmakers. A sacred ritual of renewal. Whenever Congress would open its session, the sacred ritual of renewal. A temple of democracy. The Capitol called a sacred place. In one sense, I sort of get it. But in another sense, I find it somewhat odd that religious terminology would be used for the halls of our government. Rather like seeing George Washington dressed like Zeus, the chief deity of the Greek pantheon of gods and goddesses. The capital sits where? What's it called? Anybody know? It's pretty, hmm? Capitol Hill. Duh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's pretty. It's so obvious. I shouldn't even ask it as a question, right? Just, just stated it outright. In Capitol Hill, <laughs> you know. In 1793, George Washington's Secretary of State was a guy named Thomas Jefferson, and in that role, 
Jefferson is the one who named it Capitol Hill. He named it after this place. This is kind of a, I think it's a digital model, actually, of uh, ca it's Capitoline Hill in Italy. It's one of the seven hills of Rome. On Capitoline Hill in Rome, there sat a temple, the temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus, also called the Temple of Jupiter Capitolinus. It's the word capital with Linus, the kid with okay, but but that's what it was called, Capitolinus, the Temple of Jupiter. The most important temple in ancient Rome. Think about that for a moment. This is what Jefferson is using to name the hill on where our capital sets. Okay? Building a temple. I wonder if 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 Thomas Jefferson referred to the capital as a, a building as a temple himself. <laughs> you know, it makes you think, because of what he's doing, because he's invoking the Capitoline Hill, the home of the temple of Jupiter, temple of Zeus, really. Uh, Jupiter uh, was the uh, Roman name for the Greek god Zeus, whose statue was the inspiration for Horatio Greenhouse enthroned Washington. And see, this is what... I'm kind of doing this as a pet peeve, I guess. It, it, this bothers me. The, why this fascination with Greek gods if we're supposed to be a Christian nation? What is going on? Someone would say, well, at the time, you know, neoclassic architectural style and design, that was all the rage in Europe, okay, during those days of the Enlightenment. And we talked about the Enlightenment and the Age of Reason last week where they dethroned God and, and then put man on the throne, okay? That's what all happened there. But see, that doesn't answer the question of purpose in any case. Why this? Why is this happening? Why are there these gods being represented and goddesses being represented in Washington. Why was there this emphasis on pagan deities in this country the whole time? For that matter, why do so many buildings uh, in Washington, including the Capitol, have the same kind of architecture as pagan Greece and Rome? Now, I'm not saying necessarily that the early city planners and so forth were, were pagans themselves, okay? That's not what I'm saying necessarily. But I've always been taught that America was founded as a Christian nation. Why then would you imitate the Romans who in their heyday were throwing Christians to the lions? Does that make sense to anyone else? Something weird going on here. On the interior of the Capitol Dome, above the rotunda where they were going to place that statue, and it was there for a while, but nobody liked seeing Washington without a shirt, so they had to do something about it. That, that literally is the case. They, they, it was called the shirtless statue, and they, so they had to move it. But they had it in the rotunda for a while. But on the, on the Capitol Dome, after it was built, there's this painting. It's called... The Apotheosis of George Washington. Now, by now you've heard me use the term apotheosis several times in this series, and I've defined it for you a couple of different times. It means to ascend to godhood, to become a god. Most specifically, I said that this was what was believed to have happened to every new Egyptian pharaoh who took the throne. That's when we began to talk about apotheosis. Every new pharaoh would come on the scene, and they performed a ritual over him, right? The Egyptian priest, uh, that where the spirit of the Egyptian god Osiris was invited by the pagan priest to enter into the body of the new pharaoh, leaving the old body of the old pharaoh who had died, so that Osiris could once again come back to life and rule Egypt by basically spiritually possessing this new, new king. We would call it demon possession from the Christian point of view. All right? That's apotheosis, okay? I've told you I believe a real spiritual entity, an evil spirit of the ancient age, actually did possess the Pharaoh. Perhaps the supernatural power of the prince of Egypt itself, and not the one in the movie, okay, uh, where it talks about Moses. Now, this is a, 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 the, the evil prince, the spiritual prince, like this prince of Persia, the prince of Greece that we talked about from Daniel 10. That's the real truth behind apotheosis. But here we have this painting in the Capitol Dome. 
by Greek-Italian artist Constantino Bramidi that, that portrays our first president, George Washington, becoming a god. We've already seen Washington as Zeus, looking like Zeus, sitting on a throne. Why then this emphasis on Washington becoming a god? What's going on? The original lie of Satan to humans was, you shall become as gods. That's the lie, that man can become God. In this closer view, we see Liberty, who is seated on Washington's right there, uh, and, and Victory, also known as Fame, is seated on the left. She's the one with the, the, the wonderful Louis Armstrong trumpet to her mouth there. Okay. And surrounding those central figures are 13 maidens. The banner they're holding up there says, E Pluribus Unum, out of the many ones. So those 13 maidens represent the original 13 colonies. Okay. Besides Washington becoming a god, on this painting there are other gods and goddesses on the inside of the dome of this sacred temple of democracy, as our modern members of Congress have called it. There's the goddess of war directly below Washington there. She's got uh, something raised up in the air. And you can't really see it too well, but she's holding a shield there in front with uh, a banner of stars across the top in a blue field, and then red and white stripes coming. It's Captain America's shield, really. She took it. Okay. All right. So she, she's down there. Uh, then Minerva is to her right, going up around the circle there. Minerva was the Roman goddess of wisdom, and in this painting she's talking to, with Benjamin Franklin and Samuel Morse, representing the invention in America and that kind of thing. Samuel Morse, of course, the telegraph guy who, who laid the... and that was a big thing in the 1800s, of course. Neptune, the god of the sea, uh, he's overseeing the, the transatlantic cable that runs from... Uh, from the United States over to uh, Europe and so forth, to England, I guess. And, and uh, so that's what he's doing there. Mercury is the messenger of the gods. He's on there. He's also the god of commerce. So it's overseeing that area of, of American life. And then Vulcan is the Roman god of the forge, industry and, and, and manufacturing and, and the things that were beginning to happen in the Industrial Revolution. And then the goddess Ceres is, is uh, just coming back down around towards the bottom. She's the goddess of, over agriculture. One so website that I read said the painting merely is symbolic. Okay? Washington symbolized more than just being our first president. president. He represents the very founding of our nation, and so they did this to him. But see, this doesn't settle with me. It's just, why are you using this kind of representation? You know, the, this symbolism, uh, mere symbolism, doesn't satisfy my curio curiosity. Why pagan gods in a supposedly Christian nation? Now, we did see last week how the 12th century Catholic theologian Thomas Aquinas said that human reason was, was pure, it was unfallen, okay? Was, was pure and could think purely. And when he did that, he opened the door for the return of the Greek philosophers to Western civilization. Now, everybody could read Plato in Greek and treat it almost like the Bible because these guys were using human reason, which was unfallen, okay? And that's what led to the Renaissance in Southern Europe, in Italy, in France, and, and in Spain. And, and ultimately that leads to the Age of Reason, like we talked about last week, where French thinking emphasized atheism, and that led to a bloody revolution in France, and eventually un to a dictatorship under a guy named what? Napoleon. Napoleon, right? Interesting, 